I'm the president of the New America Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you here. Uh, and uh, welcome Walter Holm. Walter was really one of the founding board members of uh, New America and has <coughs> been an uh, important part of our intellectual and uh, institutional life for a decade. And so we're delighted to host him uh, as he begins his latest uh, book tour to uh, talk about God and Gold. Uh, Walter is the Henry Kissinger Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and the author of much that is notable and good, but uh, I'm sure many of you are here because you've read uh, Special uh, Providence, his uh, 2002, three? One. I think. One book uh, about the American foreign <laughs> policy, which uh, was deservedly honored in many places, including with the Lionel Gelber Award, uh, the Canadian Pulitzer, as we uh, come to talk, uh, come to know it. Um, uh, Walter will talk for 20 or 25 minutes. I may take the chair's prerogative ask afterwards to ask one or two questions, and then we'll turn it over to you and uh, get you on your way, uh, certainly no later than 2.30. Than so thank you all very much for being here, and Walter. Welcome back. Hey. Well, it is really uh, good to be back, Steve. And I have to say, as a, as a board member, it's especially good to be back and see that we seem to have, uh, knocking on wood, uh, overcome one of the great hurdles of any uh, foundation, which is to move beyond its uh, first leader and president uh, on. I can remember when, when I was timorously warning Ted Halstead that uh, Gee, I didn't know if we could afford the rent on this thing. Could we really afford to, to uh, sign a lease on something as, as ambitious and large as this space? And Ted told me we would be okay. And uh, it's clear that Ted is a much better judge of these things than I am. And as a board member, again, I'm just <coughs> extremely pleased to see that uh, Steve is, is with us now. Now, what I want to do in talking about uh, God and Gold, which is my latest book, is just to, to sort of pick up um, uh, one of the themes that is important in the book and that I hope can kind of serve as an introduction to, to discussion today. Because the kind of central um, paradox that drives my reflections in God and Gold is sort of double paradox. The Anglo-Americans uh, for the last 300 years have managed to be two rather different things at the same time. That is to say, They've managed to be strong, and they've managed to be wrong. They've managed to be strong enough so that, in, to a very large degree, they have shaped and dominated modern world history. If you think about it, uh, either the English or the Americans has been on the winning side in every major international great power conflict since the late 17th century, as that does not include uh, wars like the Vietnam War or the British were chased out of Sudan by the Mahdi in the late 19th century, but the sort of great power wars, the major international conflicts that set the agenda for every stage, the Napoleonic Wars, World War I, World War II, the Cold War, those kinds of wars, the British haven't, have only lost one of those since 1688, and that was the American Revolution, which amazingly we won. And this is really rather extraordinary. And in fact, for 300 years, more and more and more, the world has been shaped by a, by a kind of an Anglo-American system of politics, culture, ideology, power, and trade that has become increasingly entrenched and increasingly influential uh, for a very long time. If you think about it, in 2000, this system was stronger and more entrenched globally than it was in 1900. In 1900, it was stronger and more entrenched than it was in 1800. In 1800, it was stronger and more entrenched than it was in 1700. And this almost begins to look like a pattern. But if you, uh, if you take another look at it, what you'll see is that there's an equally striking record for a very long time of the English and the Americans not having a clue what was going on in this world order that they were working so busily to build. So that, uh, you know, we're, we can all remember in 1989 the Soviet Union fell and we had not only uh, the book by uh, my friend Francis Fukuyama on uh, the end of history, 
but we had a very general view in America expressed by the first President Bush that something fundamental had changed. The American victory in the Cold War, our triumph over the evil empire, was going to usher in a new era of peace and democracy. Free markets were going to show the entire world how to be prosperous, and democratic governance was going to show the world how to live at peace. And, you know, that was just terrific. And that's really where, we, where many very serious people in the U.S. thought that we were. It wasn't where they hoped we were, it was where they thought we were. And we made foreign policy on this basis for a number of years. But it was nothing new. In fact, it's rather old. You, you can go back at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. You had people talking about how now that that fiend Napoleon has, been gone, ha, you know, has fallen from power, we can now begin the regeneration of the world. You have people like uh, uh, Tennyson who wrote in a poem, Loxley Hall, that, that uh, trade was going to bring in a new era of democracy, rule of law, and peace. He talked about, what is it, uh, purple argosies of magic sale, airborne commerce, ushering in the federation of the world and the parliament of man. Harry Truman actually used to carry that poem around in his pocket. Um, you can find that... Uh, uh, the, the older Tennyson was a little disillusioned, but Norman Angell wrote in 1911 what is still the best-selling book in the history of international relations, uh, The Great Illusion, which argued that um, economic prosperity and rule of law democracy were making war impossible, increasingly difficult and ultimately impossible. He was writing in 1911 about how it's time to put the sh soldier gently but, and respectfully but firmly on the shelf. We won't be needing him anymore in this glorious new era in which we live. The book sold millions of copies. I do understand that sales dropped off in August 1914. <laughs> uh, and yet, amazingly though, again, Four years later, 1918, Woodrow Wilson is proclaiming not, you know, now that we've won the war to make the world safe for democracy, the League of Nations is going to usher in a fundamentally new era that, again, the combination of free <coughs> economics and free government in the international rule of law is going to make war a thing of the past, usher in a, a bright new world. Well, of course, it didn't happen in 1918. But, and, and instead you have the Bolshevik Revolution and the Russian Civil War, a lot of nasty things going on. But by 1929, things were actually beginning to get better. In, you know, Europe had settled down. It appeared to most observers that Hitler had, was a spent force in German uh, politics and that the economic <clears throat> recovery was stabilizing Weimar Germany. They looked at Russia and they saw the new economic policy, or the Soviet Thermidor, as many people called it. And there was an era of cultural openness, economic openness in Soviet Russia. People looked at Japan and saw the emergence of liberal parliamentary democracy, they thought, in Japan. In parts of South America, people were hailing uh, the development of constitutional government. And then finally, to kind of top it all off, uh, the great American Secretary of State signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact that outlawed war forever. And it was ratified 85 to 1 in the Senate. And not just sort of a handful of kind of marginal idealists and so on, but serious people at the heart of American affairs argued that we had entered a new world that, again, uh, free economic development, free government, rule of law were creating a stable foundation for global peace. Well, it didn't work out in 1929 either. Uh, 1945, yet again, it's fascinating to go back and read the way people greeted the uh, uh, proclamation of the United Nations Charter in San Francisco. It was compared by conservative Republicans in the United States to a combination of Magna Carta, uh, Declaration of Independence, the Gettysburg Address. Uh, it was hailed as the foundation for a new world. There was a national prayer vigil uh, that was joined by such paragons of uh, religious piety as the American Chamber of Commerce and the American Federation of Labor praying uh, in, in sort of vigils for the ratification of the United Nations Charter. 
And again, until the outbreak of the Cold War, serious people really thought we'd turn the corner. So the Cold War ends were there again. In other words, again, for hundreds of years, the Anglo-Americans have been strong enough to win these conflicts and completely misled about what, was, what would be the result of their victories. I find that interesting. I find both, both ends of that worth thinking about, how you can be so strong and so wrong at the same time. And as far as I can tell, and this is a lot of what's in God and Gold, we're strong and we're wrong for the same reason. That is to say, there is a constellation of beliefs and attitudes in our culture, in our society, that give us a certain vision of how the world works. And that vision actually empowers us to play an extraordinary role in world history and be on the cutting edge of a lot of developments, for good and for bad, frankly. Um, but at the same time, that leads us to a kind of a, an optimism about where the world is headed that over and over and over again asserts itself in moments of crisis. So what, what is this cultural complex? Well, I call it the golden meme, M-E-M-E. -E. And it's a set of beliefs about the way the world works. It seemed to be deeply rooted in English culture and then migrated uh, over to the United States and was very well established here in the 17th century and over the last, in spite of all the immigration, all the cultural changes and everything else we've been through, has shown, as far as I can see, no signs of diminishing its hold over the American imagination. Where does it come from? If you look back in, in 17th century England, they used to look at their, um, at their system, of their legal system. Uh, and what they saw, that English common law was a system that, that at least the English were, who were rich enough to leave opinions where we're likely to be able to find them and read them, thought it was a pretty good and pretty just system of law. Pretty flexible, pretty interesting. And where did it come from? It didn't come from a grand design. No great genius wrote out the principles of English common law. What happened was over hundreds of years, and ultimately now over a thousand years, a lot of private disputes over, you know, whose cow was it? Who has the right to collect hen eggs from this certain, you know, from a certain group of birds between Michaelmas and New Year's Eve or whatever it might be? These little tiny property disputes settled according to village law, according to custom, well, in my grandfather's day, we always said it so-and-so. You know, tie went to the runner or whatever the rule was that they were invoking. That out of these kinds of cases, again, arose over centuries a system of jurisprudence, that, and a system of, of, of law that today serves, you know, there, there are a lot of you know, arcane hedge fund derivative contracts that specify shall be settled by the rule of common law. So these arguments over whose cow it was have given the basis for a legal system that now addresses you know, issues over types of property that didn't even exist in Anglo-Saxon England. And people saw the evolution of this system and came to believe that it was better that there wasn't a grand plan, better that sort of history had its way. The English looked at their political institutions and had the same vision. That is, already in the 17th century, they believed they had a mixed system with par the, the lords had some powers, the commons had some powers, parliament had power, the king had power, the judges had certain types of powers, there were local powers, there were all of these different things. Again, nobody planned it. Nobody, you know, the, the, the English constitution, which still to this day hasn't been written down, didn't spring out of the mind of some glorious genius but emerged out of the battles of English history, where nobody was really thinking about a grand design for the future. They were trying to win a, a political struggle over this issue or that issue. And so out of all of these struggles had arisen a stately system of government that again proved they felt to be flexible and the English as chauvinistic then as we and they still are today thought was the best in the world. Um, you think about Adam Smith's vision of how the economy works. 
and it's really very much, it's, it's English common law all over again. That is to say, from the jostlings and the interplay of private actors pursuing private interests emerges an, ec an economy that works better than an economy that was designed by anyone or planned by anybody. That is to say, following only the laws of their own nature, the, the sort of laws written in their heart, so to speak, human beings have brought forth something that was greater than anything that any of them intended. You know, that, that as if by the workings of an invisible hand, an order had emerged from this chaos. That's how the English who defended the Anglican Church saw the Anglican Church emerging from the rather strange battles of, uh, of Reformation England. I mean, it's very hard to argue that Henry VIII was a great saint of God who had some vision for what the church should look like. Although, as I'm, a, as I'm an Episcopalian, I find it's always helpful when, I, when I'm in an ethical dilemma, I just ask myself, what would Henry VIII do? <laughs> and then I find, you know, I find a clear path opening before me. You begin to think, is there any way we could just make this problem shorter? <laughs> and often that, that clears things up. So, uh, but out of these struggles, out of corrupt kings and out of bishops fighting for their perquisites and their tithes came what Anglicans believed was the right church, the church of God. To really think about it, this was, this was uh, Sir Francis Bacon's um, vision of how science should work that historically people had thought science proceeds deductively. You, you philosophically derive the principles that run the universe. Then you deduct from that, the, from those grand principles, to what's happening in small cases. Bacon said, do it the other way. Start with the observation of small facts. And instead of trying to impose a grand you know, pattern on them from the beginning, let the pattern emerge from the facts. You will find the laws of nature in this way. Again, as we found the laws of society from the process of common law, as we found, the, as we were later under Smith, to find economic uh, prosperity from these unguided small facts and acts. This is our theory of the American Constitution that the checks and balances of our Constitution, that the struggles of different interest groups, different states, would yield a way of governing the country that was better than having sort of the wisest person in the country or whatever sort of decide how things should be. It's Darwin's theory of evolution that out of the sort of struggles of all of these creatures running around to eat and, ha and reproduce, you get these complex ecologies, you get the, the development of structures like the eye, like the ear, that you ultimately get intelligence and even social development itself, all coming from the sort of unguided activities. Faith in the invisible hand, that is the golden mean. It shapes the way the Anglo-American world encounters natural phenomena, social phenomena, historical struggles. It gives us the toolkit out of which we try to solve virtually every problem that comes into our, into our reach. Even at the New America Foundation, I find that, that, that there's, a, there's a constant sort of, you know, return to this model of how the world works and what we should do. Um, not everybody in the world feels that way. This is not the way everybody sees things, experiences either their history or world history. And the fact is, this turns out to be an extraordinarily effective mindset for a society in an era of capitalist growth and change. Because capitalism is not just a system of market economics. You know, I mean, we can think about market economics, and that's very interesting and important, but capitalism is also a social system. And capitalism is a system in which, above all, the direction of, of investment capital to new technologies and new ideas creates an accelerating rhythm of social change that transforms pol politics, 
transforms culture, transforms religion, transforms uh, gender relations, the way people relate to one another. Regions of the country or regions of the world will rise to great prosperity or go down in a generation. Changes that used to take millennia are compressed into decades. And this is what, this is what since capitalism is about. For a society that values the golden mean and lives by the golden mean, what, what, the, what, what happens then is, is in capitalism, you're experiencing change. A lot of this change is uncomfortable. A lot of the disruption actually kind of looks ugly. And there's a tendency to say, you know, uh, the old way was better. You know, they used to say, uh, how many Virginians does it take to change the light bulb? Two, one to change the bulb, and one to talk about how much better the old one was. And there is, you know, th so there's, there's resistance to it. But we've been taught, we've absorbed in all kinds of ways that the essence of being ourselves, the essence of being true to who we are involves saying yes to the new and taking the risks, letting the invisible hand do its job because it is bringing something forward better than what we see and know. I would argue that religiously this goes back to the very individualistic forms of Anglo-American Protestantism where you sort of go back to God's call to Abraham in the Hebrew Scriptures which is reported as God saying to Abraham, leave your father and your father's house, your father's gods, and come to a new land, and there I'll, find you, I'll show you the promise. In much of the world today, people still feel, I think, that, that there's a tragic trade-off between modernity and change and all the things that capitalism imposes, and then a sort of a, the hallowed ground of religion tradition and meaning, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, that the, the distinction between them appears very stark. In the English-speaking world, it's never been quite so stark. Not that we don't have a lot of debates about capitalism, not that some of us want to go faster, some want to go slower, we're constantly arguing and revising it, but over time, this inner optimism, this faith in the invisible hand, has pushed us forward and this I think has played a major role in making the Anglo-American world as powerful and influential as it has been both for good and for ill. But it's also this that makes us think, that our faith in the invisible hand makes us think that the end of history, that the peaceable kingdom, the millennium is just around the corner. Because we see God at work bringing order out of chaos. We see the invisible hand bringing out of the collision of, of animals trying to survive or, or peasants arguing over whose cow it is or traders trying to make money. We see a beautiful order emerging from that. So of course from the interplay of nations and cultures. Of course we're going to see the invisible hand producing an order out of that. And we are conditioned, we are deep, more than conditioned, we are deeply shaped to perceive history as that kind of process at work. So we're strong and we're wrong. And we're, we're wrong for the, for instance, the same reason that we're strong. Now this is not, I must say, an answer to all the problems that face us today. But it's an interesting starting point. And I think as, as, as Americans think today about how do we live in a world in which uh, not only our mistakes, but some of our values are found to be deeply offensive or to run, cut across the grain of other cultures with their own agendas, other peoples with their own desires, you know, how do we begin to reduce the chances of conflicts in a world in which conflict becomes increasingly dangerous and expensive, all those Norman Angel things about why war really is a bad idea. Um, I think trying to look at some of the cultural foundations of our views of the world and their views of the world help us to begin to stumble forward towards something I call the diplomacy of civilizations which is the ability of different peoples from different cultures to try to live together in a world which, for better or worse, continues to be deeply shaped 
by the playing out of these extraordinary forces that have their roots in Anglo-American cultural history. That's a kind of an introduction to what I've been thinking about and what's in the book. Hopefully it will provide you with some material for reflection and for questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Uh, that was really terrific. I'm sure many of us would like to sign up for the semester-long version. You do offer that someplace, right? Yeah. It's in a book. It's yeah. in book form. Yeah, that's actually. true. And, and those of you who exit on Connecticut Avenue will note that Kramer Books is uh, directly across the street. I wanted to just take the chair's prerogative to ask a couple of questions, one about the strong part and one about the wrong part. Um, so you began as you Oops, can't see me over yes, here. So I'll I think probably better. You can uh, call on the audience as you wish yeah. after I'm done. Um, but in your survey of 400 years of successful contests between uh, Britain and the United States and major powers uh, who emerged at times as adversaries, do you do you perceive or do you argue for in the book a capacity that this diverse and deliberately uh, eclectic system and, and constellation of ideas creates that contributes or defines the success in those uh, wars? I mean, we discover that democracies are not very good at fighting uh, regional counterinsurgencies, but do they, and we can easily describe the reasons why. But is there an inverse to that for uh, millennial, territorial, global, continental wars? Okay. Well, you know, I do think that um, and it's remarkable, for example, when, when you have to mobilize for total war. It's extraordinary that the Anglo-Americans who in peacetime are generally sort of less organized than other people actually do better at fighting total war. Uh, than many of their adversaries. In World War II, the British actually used a far higher percentage of their GDP in the war effort than the, than the Germans ever managed to do, although the Nazis were trying to lay their hands at uh, this sort of spontaneously self-organizing British society seemed to sort of manage it better than the kind of top-down um, uh, German command and control system. So there's that. In the book, I also talk about um, that there's a geopolitical strategy that, that is associated with this worldview and with the capitalism. It's, it's, and it's basically a sea power strategy. You, um, uh, the Dutch uh, kind of invented it, but you, you have an open society at home. In the book I call this, by the way, the Protocols of the Elders of Greenwich, the secret Anglo-Saxon plan for world domination. I'm not sure that this audience is cleared for this information, <laughs> but... Uh, um, uh, sort of step one is you have this open society that's dynamic, capitalistic, and, and so on. Step two is you then take that show on the road, you engage with the rest of the world through trade, and so on. It makes you very rich. You have a lot of ideas, you have a lot of products, you have a lot of financial techniques, and so on. With that money, you sustain a geopolitical strategy aimed at preserving the basis of your power. You control or you, you police sea lanes, trade routes for information. The British, for example, wanted to make sure that they secured the roots of the, of the cables that uh, linked the world in the 19th century. We're concerned about the internet or we're concerned about data flows and so on. So you, you're, you control the sort of linking, uh, linkage. You think of the world as a, as a single system and you think of different theaters within it. You have a Europe policy, an Asia policy, but it's all part of a global policy. And you find British prime ministers in the 18th century saying that in this country, whose interests are worldwide, ministers must consider the whole globe in their thinking. And then the sea power, and then you have a balance of power strategy on key, in key theaters as well, which is a cheaper and more effective strategy. Then you, you build a global trading network. You know, you've built this global trading network. You invite other people in. You say to the Germans and the Japanese after World War II, uh, come on in. Your money's as good as anybody else's. Get as rich as you like. We won't hold you back. You can buy raw materials. You can trade. You can invest. You can sell whatever you want to do. And which means that they tend to get 
you know, they kind of are less willing to fight you. They, they don't see as much point in fighting you. Yes, you're top dog, and it's very annoying to listen to all of your boasting, and every now and then you do something incredibly stupid that they don't like. On the other hand, they're just making money, and how bad is that really? So not bad enough to start a war. Uh, and then if, God forbid, they do start a war, and Norman Angel turns out to be wrong, it turns out that in peace their economies have grown addicted to global sources of supply, raw materials, finance, markets. And so when war comes and you cut them off, they face all kinds of problems which end up materially contributing to your victory. And finally, most evilly and deviously and cynically of all, you promote liberal principles around the world. And uh, this has the effect. So that grand strategy, it seems to me, um, which is empowered by this sort of cultural foundation which creates the open society and so on, I think those two things together are, are mm. why the, the big wars tend to work out as well as they do. Mm. Thank you. Very satisfying. Um, so on the wrong side, you referred to the ways in which or the, the uh, easily observable fact that substantial sections of the world uh, don't share some of the assumptions built into this constellation of ideas. But if you were to turn around and write your 400-year narrative from the point of view of the opposition, do you think that you would find that the principal theme of their opposition was an opposition to power or an opposition to um, the ideas and the principles uh, that are expressed through that power? Actually, the, uh, in, the, in the book I've got a chapter, uh, How They Hate Us, which uh, looks, you know, and it says, looks at what they have been saying about us and one of the, for, for the last 300 years. One of the remarkable things is how similar it is. Uh, you can look at some of Osama bin Laden's manifestos and they echo themes that have been developing in this anti-Anglo-American literature for, for 300 years. Um, and what, what they generally say is, you say you are about freedom and liberty, but what you're really about is about power and greed unlimited by any law of man or God. So that, um, you know, the, the Whig version of the English Reformation is, you know, religious liberty. The anti-Whig version of that is the nobles dispossessing the church and the peasants of the land for the start of the enclosure process. Um, Cromwell talked about, you know, his war for, his, he, he, in his speech, uh, 1656, he's making a speech on the war in Spain. He says, who are our enemies and why do they hate us? It is the league of all the evil people on earth. <laughs> and uh, what do we want from them? Liberty, he says, only that. To which they point out, look at what you've done in Ireland, you hypocritical, evil SOB. There is no limit to your greed, no limit to your depravity, to your cynicism and your hypocrisy. And that pretty much we are for liberty, we are for freedom, you are a hypocrite, you're an oppressor, your greed and, and, and your guilt are unbearable. That sort of thing has been moving. The interesting with the French sense of it, um, for, for, for over 200 years they've spoken of the English as Carthage, and now we are Carthage, which is the mercantile, cruel, suspiciously Semitic power that dueled with the virtuous <laughs> republican farmers of Rome. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's just a different twist on it. But yeah, there, there, there are real kind of parallels and similarities, and I think that's, so what we're hearing today is pretty much what, what we've been hearing for quite a while. Excellent. Turn you over to your audience. I'll let you yes, point great. and choose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Reggie Dale, uh, senior fellow at CSIS with experience on both sides of the Atlantic, but, um, originating in Britain. Mm. And uh, um, there's so many things I could say about that, I'll try and limit it. But basically, yes, I mean, the general theme, you're absolutely right. And I, I think you could add to that that this is the way, actually, the English language was formed, through this sort of pragmatic, include everything, you know, rather than by looking at a, 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 a great rule for the language. Right, we don't have an Académie Française yes, or anything of the kind. It's a huge advantage. I mean, as Margaret Thatcher said, the uh, English language comes with its own built-in value system, which it does in a way. 
Uh, and that's the way the British Empire was born. We, we're, we're a trading post here. Oh, we'll need another trading post here. Oh, we'll need to pacify that tribe there. And we'll need a, a, right. a garden better here. I mean, that's how it built up. And then you looked at the whole thing in the 19th century and said, gosh, you know, we've got to look at the whole world. And uh, as you quoted the... You know, All right. the, the globe, it was that way around. It wasn't an attempt to say, let's run the globe and then see how to do it. All right. it. It's the other way around. And it was also conceived defensively. We've got to stop those evil French from doing it because they'll throttle us if we don't. It wasn't conceived of an... Pitt didn't think of himself as an aggressor. He thought of himself as defending England against yes. the French. But I, uh, that leads on to what I, something I was going to say, that, that, that um, on the continent of Europe, you, you have people who look at things through the vision on the grand design. Right. Um, Britain was always insulated from that by being an island, which is incredibly important, and allowed it to develop its own national identity and a continuity of institutions, which is absolutely fundamental to the history of, uh, of Britain. But the, the, well, what I was getting towards is that in addition to the belief in, in the golden mean, as you call it, there is also a deep suspicion of grand design right. and a feeling that that leads to totalitarianism, communism, uh, whatever, uh, and that you must not go down that path. And you see that today, for example, in the European Union, where you, you have uh, the visionaries on the continent who, who say, let's have a European Union and all commit ourselves to it, right. and then see how we get there. Whereas the British say, oh, we couldn't possibly agree to a European Union. We don't know what it means. Right. Let's muddle along and see what it's called. See but what in it practice, like. we can have this yeah. agreement and that agreement. If I can, if I can just, uh, if I can just ask Walter to respond to that, yeah, because I, I want to. One, okay, sure. Uh, but that is actually a weakness on the British side because it leads to a lack of understanding for the motivation of other people, and they don't understand the vision people on the continent, they don't understand what's going on there, and it lets Britain get excluded from developments that ought to be part of that. that. If I could just cast it into a question, uh, Walter, because you and I were talking before we came in about this drift between the United States and Europe, and so what are the implications uh, today uh, in terms of eyesight uh, toward Europe? and, and right. in the other direction? Well, again, I think it's, it, it's very important to sort of get the English had kind of two doses of this, one by being, as you say, insular, the other is the Reformation, where you know, the Reformation is the rejection of a global system of morality, law, and order, and saying, no, 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 what happens is it gets corrupt. When you try to institutionalize on a, on a mass basis, you get the Pope and the Vatican selling indulgences and whatever else. And so this is, and, and then you get an English history, it's sort of done, Charles the, you know, Charles the First, James the Second, are seen as these princes imposing a tyranny in the name of some kind of grand design. And the American Revolution, that's what, they didn't, that's what we didn't like about George the Third and his ministers, the same kind of sense of some horrible overarching thing. Now the reality is you can't live without either one of them. You, both the overarching visions in central power and a kind of a resistance and struggle against it are, you know, they're, they're both kind of two poles of human experience and political organization. The people who took this theory furthest in America were the Confederates who took the separatist thing apart and they wrote a constitution so weak that their government was crushed. Um, now I've written this book not <coughs> to sort of mindlessly extol the Anglo-American distinct view, although I think it's I think we do have to note that it has been winning these contests for a very long time. And so there's certain practical force to it, if nothing else. But if you're going to understand the other, you really do, I think, have to begin by having some sense of, of yourself um, and trying to get a sense of why you think as you do makes it easier to see why, why others think the way they do. I think in practical terms, the British problem has gotten much easier with the expansion of the EU. Uh, and that this sort of ability, there are a lot of people in Central and Eastern Europe who are suspicious of grand designs, whether they're made in, in Paris or made in Berlin. And I think it may be possible to, you know, the British, after all, have been very successful for hundreds of years playing the balance of power role in Europe before the European Union. I don't see why the British can't begin to recover that sense 
but it does require becoming more, you know, politically engaged. You can't do that by staying out. Shall I? I'll reverse yeah, oh, my moderator. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Clint Leverett from the New America Foundation. Say, this way you can call on the big contributors. That's right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So all of you identify yourselves now. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to ask you, Walter, about another type of opposition to this Anglo-American worldview and grand strategy that you articulate so well. I mean, I think you're, you're right that there is this kind of consistent set of themes that in a sense, anti-modern opponents of the Anglo-American combine over 300 years have resorted to, someone like bin Laden resorts to them today. But you want to say they're all pathological like him, you know, they're, sure. there are reasonable grounds too sure. for these positions. Sure. But there seems to me another set of opposition arguments which is is coming up. And it's essentially a product of, of post-Cold War globalization, that more and more around the world you have pockets of, and some now quite large and increasingly interconnected pockets, of people who have bought into the arguments about open economics, capital flows across borders, the importance of international trade to prosperity, and who now do those things very, very well. But their argument is the other part of this, the, the kind of liberal approach to, to politics, the emphasis on individual choice and insight as a guiding force for social life, um, that they're not so willing sure. to buy into, and, it's, and in some cases explicitly <coughs> reject that. Right. Now, if you look at the way the distribution of wealth is shifting around the world, you might argue that it is people in this category that I am describing, people in places like China people in other emerging Asian economies, um, people in the Persian Gulf. I suspect over the next decade the GCC may emerge in the aggregate as the world's most important investor. How are we going to fare, how are we going to react to, how are we going to um, deal with this kind of challenge, a challenge from a kind of tacit coalition of countries that want to play the same economic game that we do, but aren't prepared to buy, in a sense, the whole pack. First of all, that's not new, in the sense that modernization without full democratization has been the agenda of many societies for the last 300 years in various ways. I mean, Bismarck's Germany being a, okay. being a great example, but far from the only one. Um, and it's, you know, that's been kind of a theme. Now, in general, what seems to happen is these society it works okay for a while, uh, but then you sort of reach a point where it doesn't work as well. Um, and I, you know, I look at China, and it's hard for me to see an exception to this rule uh, developing. When I look at China's environmental problems, uh, I look at some of the problems that the commoditization of the commoditization of manufacturing is depressing producer incomes. China's being squeezed in the one hand by um, more competition for manufacturing is keeping the margins low on the top end for producers but also rising uh, demand for, for commodities and raw materials is bidding up the prices that they can pay. Uh, for China to be able to continue to modernize while its population is both becoming um, more uh, demanding because, you know, it's, when you're coming off the, the farm as a peasant and you're getting a job in a factory, you're just happy to have a job in the factory, but your kid is going to want more. Um, 
and also they'll be more organized. You know, Marx used to say that uh, peasants can only be organized like a sack of potatoes. You can put them in a sack, but people who are urbanized and, and so on are much more effective political force. China right now lacks the institutions, and I think it may lack the means to manage this emerging conflict of rising expectations on a number of levels. So I think Chinese history is going to be tumultuous in, in the future. And I don't think we've seen the, the last act of that drama. Um, and in terms of the GCC and these others, um, again, I think uh, it, it's amazing how little of a, of a threat Saudi Arabia has managed to be. You know, it's just, they can sort of, you know, they, they pile up a lot of money. Now, they've got, they've got a couple of choices. They can invest it according to market rules, basically seeking market returns, in which case, willy-nilly, they're kind of helping the system work and providing capital to sources of innovation, including stuff in the U.S. Or they can invest for political reasons, in which case their capital will not grow relative to the wealth of the world system, and they won't, you know, their, their power will diminish. It's an odd sort of thing where the power, if, as long as you're willing to go with the flow, you have sort of power, but if you fight the flow, your power immediately begins to diminish. Now, how all of this works out in practice, my, root, my gut sense is that the 21st century is going to be more complicated and tumultuous and difficult than the 20th century was. Just as the 20th century was more all of those things than the 19th, and the 19th than the 18th. Um, so I'm not here to sort of, I don't want to reinvent Whig optimism and tell you, you know, happy, happy, joy, joy, and uh, the end of history is just around the corner. But I think the dynamics that have made the Anglo-American successful may persist, even in the midst of this turbulence. Yes, sir, in the back will come up. Hi, I, I just want to follow up on Paul's question and, and ask you to address uh, the way that uh, two sets of countries, first of all, our former World War II adversaries, uh, Japan and Germany, are they firmly and irrevocably anchored in the system and do they share all their underlying <coughs> cultural values and, and uh, beliefs that we have and, and also uh, take a look at, uh, at Russia. What do you think about Russia's uh, relationship to, uh, culturally speaking, to uh, this Anglo-American system okay. as well? Well, the first one is easy. Russia hates and fears the Anglo-American system, hates, fears, and envies, and loathes, uh, and loves. And uh, this is nothing new. And it has caused Russia a great deal, Russia and the rest and its neighbors, a great deal of unhappiness in the past. This is likely to continue. Um, uh, Germany and Japan are somewhat, you know, that, you know, I mean, we have the same thing in the U.S. You know, I'm from the South, and when I was a kid, we all used to talk about how oh, we're so different from those cold Yankees. We have warm family lives. You know, we cultivate the whole self, but we envy their power and their money. Uh, <clears throat> You know, and then, you know, you go up to a place like Ohio, which we thought of as cold, heartless Yankee, and they said, we're warm, loving Midwesterners who have family lives, unlike those, like, East Coast people. They're so instrumental in their use of each other, no family life, it's all money, money, money. You get to, like, New Jersey, and people say, oh, my God, those New Yorkers, they're terrible. <laughs> you know, you get to the five boroughs, and everybody talks about how horrible the Manhattanites are, and then in Manhattan, everybody talks about how horrible all those other people they know are. But in contrast to themselves. So this sort of sense of, you know, east-west, cold, warm, having an intermediary position between what's perceived to be the extreme of, <coughs> of alienation and brutality of modern capitalism and then, you know, the foolishness of, of utter rejection is a common stance. I think the Germans and the Japanese have showed pretty good ingenuity in the last 60 years at both maintaining a sense of mental and psychological distance while always managing to do what's needed when the chips are down, maybe not on a short timetable, but over time, to keep from kind of decisively falling out, off the table. And I wouldn't be surprised if they managed to keep that going. And it seems to work okay for them. It seems to work okay for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Victor Basu, consultant in national security policy. Mr. Mead, you identified two forces in history. One of them is evolution, and the other one is invisible hand. 
what's underlying these forces? What's underlying the invisible hand? Of course, you can answer this very simple. God does that. Uh, and this may well be true. But at the same time, it seems to me that what may be underlying these both of these forces is human rationality, or what Hegel called reason, capital R. And somehow, in the process of, uh, of small conflicts, small misunderstanding about uh, uh, who is the owner of this cow and so on and so forth, the human rationality decides what's the right thing, and it evolves to bigger and bigger and bigger issues, and somehow it guides our history. True, we have deviations from this human rationality. We had fascism, we had communism, and so on and so forth. But it's a little like a stock market. It goes up and up. Occasionally, we go down. Then we defeat uh, whatever deviation is, uh, depressions, or mm -hmm. whatever. And then we keep going on. So the two concepts, evolution and uh, an invisible hand, go together. I mean, evolution is there. The invisible hand provides human rationality, perhaps God's will, and uh, somehow we keep evolving. So maybe what you are referring to, this Anglo-Saxon com combination, is really the hub of the world. This is where somehow miraculously started, but it's spreading elsewhere and spreading throughout the world. And maybe we'll have some fruitful results, maybe 100 years from now or 200 years from now. Well, the, you you, you'll certainly find a lot of Anglo-Saxons who agree with that with that reasoning, and I don't fully disagree. But in the um, in the book, I actually do talk about the sort of Hegelian ramifications of uh, of this. And I say that you know I look at the big debate that we've been having uh, uh, in the world, sort of between what's what we we've been calling a debate between Hegel and and uh, or rather between Fukuyama and Huntington you know, end of history or clash of civilizations, where um, the end of history is exactly that, that the sort of rise of liberal capitalist democracy represents the triumph of human reason, and it's globally irresistible and will triumph because it sort of conforms to human nature, whether you want to add a, a theological layer on top of that or not, you know, as, as you were saying. And then you have the opposing point of view that the, the cultural and civilizational differences are so deep that, that instead we're, we're entering an era of conflict, in a sense, over questions of reason. Um, and what I, what I, the position I kind of come to in the book is, first of all, I say this is actually just simply the latest stage of a very old debate in Western culture. It really starts out as... Uh, you know, Kant and Hegel on the one side and Herder on the other, the German romantics that, you know, who said this is kind of a reaction part of the French Revolution. What you Jacobins are saying that there's one way and we're all going to go there, us, we Germans reject that completely. Uh, and Herder would make the point that a language isn't just another set of words to say something. It's a, it's a vision of the world, a philosophy. And in a sense, what's true in Paris isn't necessarily true in Germany, or what's true in, today we would say, what's true in, in China isn't necessarily true in New York, or neither of those could be true in Baghdad. And that people have different views, and that in this view, progress, history isn't a process of all sort of <coughs> coming together to one cosmopolitan rational system or unity, but of trees growing up in a forest. And as they grow, their leaves might touch, but they don't meld into one cosmopolitan canopy. A maple tree is a maple tree, and a pine tree is a pine tree. And the debate over these two visions of the historical process is, you know, really begins far before Huntington and Fukuyama. Uh, what I end up, where I end up coming down on this in the book is to say that as far as I can tell, they're both true. And it's a little bit like those frustrating experiments that say that light is made of particles and light is a wave. Um, they're, they're, they're both true. That is to say that, that capitalism is such a powerful system of economic and social organization that it cannot be successfully resisted that one simply must 
you know, sort of the gunboats arrive in the 19th century, Japan and China both realize we've got to either change or we're going to go down. And Japan changes and China goes down, at least at that, at that time. Uh, but the choice was objective and forced on them. It was not subjective, it was, it was an objective circumstance. And I think that largely remains the case today, that you've got to learn to run with this model and run with this system, or you find yourself in all kinds of horrible trouble as you become less powerful and less capable of controlling, shaping the world and shaping what others do to you. On the other hand, what is fascinating is that this universal force of liberal capitalism has the paradoxical result of actually magnifying the importance of the continuing cultural differences in the world. So that again in the 19th century, the fact that the Japanese could figure out some way to manage it meant that they had one kind of history and the Chinese were overwhelmed by it and had another. Or that, that culture, their cultural ability to play this game <coughs> May, had a tremendous difference in their standing. You know, it doesn't matter in the world today that <laughs> that Nigeria doesn't like baseball very much, and you know, and Japan does. But it matters a lot that Japanese culture has managed to kind of incorporate a lot of the dynamism of capitalism and institutionally manage it, and Nigeria has it matters a tremendous amount. So that I think what happens is that as this universal force of liberal capitalist democracy through in large part Anglo-American uh, uh, power, global power, but not, ex not entirely, as that presses more and more on history and on human civilization, the cultural differences among us have an ever more profound impact on the events that we all face. In, in some ways, this is you know like asking what happens when an irresistible force meets an immovable object. Unfortunately, the, the traditional answer given to that is that there's a powerful explosion. But I think we've seen some evidence of that. So how do we man how we manage that? The interface of an irresistible force with objects that, while not immovable, are slow to move. The, the, the diplomacy of civilization, it <coughs> seems to me is this question of how do different civilizations and cultures manage the increasing powerful presence of a certain kind of social and economic system. Thank you. Esther Bremer, Center for Transatlantic Relations, Johns Hopkins University, it's nice to see you. Um, would you ask two related questions? The first is to go back to the point about one of the advantages the Anglo American community has had over the past 20 years has been rule setting and actually very, I would argue, very effectively making rules, sometimes a little late, but generally making rules to deal with major changes, whether economic changes, political changes, whether creating these in, in the 20th century, the UN system, and other systems, we've been fairly good at creating rule systems that then others bought into. And I wonder now if one of our challenges past 2001 is we've not done that very well. That we've so lost that side of it, forgotten the points of that side of it. And that we also need to have others who buy into our system. So one question is, the, the, how well are we working on incorporating those others? And here I'm going back to Brazil, China, uh, Brazil, uh, South Africa, India, and others who might be open to our version of the rules. And then a related question to that is the legacy of the Anglo-American impact and how that happened to occur. Because you could also argue that one of the uh, that for large number of states across the globe, including our own, have had obviously an impact with, say, the Westminster system. And obviously, we took a different path, but clearly, the United States and the Dominions, you could argue, um, had an experience of Anglo-American diplomacy that was successful. The question is, how? What about those countries that had, were also, let's say, British colonies, not the Dominions? Um, what's been the legacy, and how well will they be able to incorporate what you might see the benefits from the British system? And I would highlight India, <coughs> Nigeria, and South Africa, and some of those are obviously the touch points too. But can you talk a bit about that? Because it seems to be in order to answer the first question, are those are there countries that can help buy into our rule system? Questions: What's the legacy and experience of those right. who might have a negative view of it? Okay. Good. Well. I think the rules, uh, the rule setting, and the role of rules in the Anglo-American uh, world is is actually a tremendously important one. But I think um, people often come at it from, I think maybe a, a slightly, they come at it from a direction that isn't as fruitful as you might hope. Just that people say, well, the rules are 
accepted because they are, you know, they're perceived as fair or something. It's a little trickier than that. And one, one thing I would look at is, uh, it, it, it's fascinating, to, and one of the great indices of, of Anglo-American world influence is the fact that virtually every sport today played around the world is played under rules that were developed between about 1850 and 1920 in Britain and or the United States. Some a little earlier, but you know, track and field, swimming, soccer, baseball, cricket, rugby, even lacrosse and hockey that originally sort of come from other places. Um, these sports actually were, tennis was actually invented, modern tennis from the, from the medieval game of real tennis by the British Croquet Association that was looking for a, um, you know, looking for an more, something more interesting and dynamic than croquet, which wasn't actually that hard to, to look for. I <laughs> uh, uh, you know, golf is a little older and so on. Uh, Marquis of Queensbury rules for boxing. And what's interesting is that basically in these, the passion that animates these systems of rules is not to tone down competition but to make competition keener, you know, and, and to make broader competition more, more uh, possible. You know, as the railroad came in, you could start having leagues. And so it's not just the people on the village green playing the time-tested village rules. You're going to get on the train and go half a day away and play, and it's gonna, you're going to have standings and tables and all of this kind of stuff, you know, basically on the cheap newspapers that working people can read. This whole culture grows out of, of that experience. And, you know, generally in, in a lot of the world today, when people think about capitalism and regulation, what they think of is that the two are opposed and that the goal of regulation is to tamp down the dangerous fires of capitalism so they don't burn people. The Anglo-American approach was much more sort of how do we enable competition. And it's sort of more a, it's kind of a, a trellis on which the rose can grow, you know, rather than some sort of damper on the fire. And it was because, in, in a sense, it was because the, con and, and our financial markets were regulated in the same spirit, add a little bit of piraticism and chicanery, but why not? And so the, uh, um, and it was, it was this force, I think, that made those rules so pervasive rather than a sense of, you know, sort of abstract, huh, those look like the just rules for a sport based on kicking dead pigskin around a field. But then to sort of bring that up to today and, and where does that leave us now, um, first of all, I have to say that as far as I can tell, there's never been a time in the history of the world that India was more attuned to this whole system than it is now. Uh, and actually, I would say Brazil, too, is uh, even under a, a, you know, the, a left-wing government. Uh, Brazil is actually, you know, but India is a great example because I had the, I'm the first American who was ever invited to speak to address the Corps of Cadets at the Indian Tri-Service Academy, which is their Army, Navy, and Air Force. The, the kids all study together. And I gave them a talk about the Anglo-American system and India's role in the future of that system and, you know, British Empire, you know, the whole thing. And I got a standing and very enthusiastic ovation because what they perceive, what these cadets perceived, is that this whole thing is a way forward for India. And that, you know, the, this is a set of rules under which India can <coughs> prosper, even if some of it, you know, starting position a little unjust and so on. You know, and even though they've got, you know, they got a long list of historical you know, the, they, have a, they have a list of bones they'd like to pick with the Brits, but that's not what matters about the future. So I think it is, you know, and I, by the way, I find the same thing to be largely true in China. I find less anti-Americanism there than I did 10 or 15 years ago, and it has something to do with the fact that a lot of people in China think that the system is working in their favor to some degree. Not that there aren't problems, and not that they, again, don't have bones to pick. So I think it's Rules that create games that people want to play uh, is something that we need to do. And this is something I more addressed in my last book than in this one, but what, we're, what I think the crisis of American foreign policy in the first 10 years of the, of the 20th century, 21st century 
has been sort of two interlocking things. One, one, the whole war on terror, our reactions to that and all that stuff. But the other has been that capitalism has entered a new and much more disruptive and disturbing phase to a lot of people. Sort of after World War II, the Europeans had more or less made their peace with Fordist mass production, mass consumer capitalism, even though before the war they hated it. But they, they bought it and accepted it. And, it, and, they, and they'd become at home with it. So now that capitalist, you know, the, the kind of capital that people are comfortable with is passing away, and something new and much more disruptive is appearing, and at the same time, the security situation has been what it's been, and our reactions to it have been what they've been. And it's been the intersection of those two forces, I think, has had a tremendous impact and continues to have one. And unfortunately, the Bush administration was not particularly good at thinking about, you know, how these two things interplaying together, how those, what kind of an international climate were they likely to create? One or two more, sir. Uh, my name is Mike Holt. Uh, I, uh, I just am reminded when I heard something described uh, the features of the system of, of a neural network. It, it reminds me very much of the training of the neural network. And if you have one of those, just number of players and nodes, it's extremely efficient and it's very flexible, very supple, very capable of having problems. It can be replicated and can be spread out. But it is vulnerable, and, and I think in some centers there's a, a vulnerable thing I wish you could talk about more, uh, to bad luck. And also it's prosperous, it has good luck. Uh, if, if there are things that can from the outside, so that uh, if one has large environmental shocks, all out or, or you know, raise that to some power, and you know, things things uh, that change very very much. And the Anglo-American system uh, had a great deal of luck. The Scottish Enlightenment did the current time. He was born. In where it was born in the Royal Society of England. And those were, those There's were a lot of people as smart as Newton might have been born in other places at the same time, probably, but just didn't have that. Probably quite a few of them died off. I mean, this, you know, or certainly yeah. among the kids you'll know. So luck played a large role in successful people as well as successful societies. And in the main, to either ignore or to, to well, diminish the role of luck in at all. Well, this is why I'm, I'm talking about the, the very unique set of historical experiences that have formed this mindset in the English-speaking world. Um, and I think we have to be, you know, agnostic uh, in the sense of how, how did it get to be there. And obviously, we have to say if a meteor hit the Earth and wiped out North America, there would be profound changes in the, in the world system. Uh, and on the other hand, if we discovered a really cheap and clean substitute for, if, you know, for, for oil that underlies all the surface soil of North America, we'd get something else. Um, so clearly, luck affects it. Uh, and, you, and it doesn't take a lot of work to imagine a range of scenarios that could be pretty deeply destabilizing, or for that matter, very helpful. But I think where, you know, what makes, what gives the system whatever kind of stability it's got, and, and it's unknowable how much this would have looking forward, is precisely the responsiveness and flexibility, which suggests that nothing else would work any better. That under any given set of conditions, uh, the chances are that this system would, would, would outperform because after all, shocks would force other kinds of systems to respond, and lacking flexibility, they might, they might have a harder time. Uh, George Keyes, um, you describe the Anglo-American um, experience um, as if it were a continuum. And I wonder if there aren't some unique characteristics that the American ascendancy has added to that system. And um, I don't know whether we want to call it American exceptionalism um, or a sense that universalizing your values is a way of justifying what you do. But um, I look at the um, occupations of Iraq by the British and the occupation of Iraq by us at different times in the 20th century and, and see profound differences between 
the assumptions that they had and carried with them. How do you distinguish between what's the American character to this to this machine? Well, there are differences, but first of all, I would say that we are far more similar to Victorian Britain than to Britain before after that period. And so I would look, you know, I think of Macaulay rewriting the Indian civil code and reforming the Indian educational system, reforms that to some degree continue to shape India today, um, or to the suppression of um, Sati and, and uh, the thugs in, uh, in India, controversial as those things were. So that I think in its rising phase, uh, Britain was more like we are, when it was in kind of this beginning to, to sense the, 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 the end and the transition, you saw a different set of circumstances. So one study I would really suggest for, for people that are seriously interested in America is the politics, the philosophies, and the, the foreign and colonial policies of 19th century Britain. I think you'll be stunned at how many debates uh, sort of prefigure things that, that we're wrestling with today, and maybe even there's some insight there. But as to where we are, you know, what makes us different from the British, uh, well, it's a long, it, you know, it, it is a very long list. Uh, but I think Macaulay, it was Macaulay that talked about how the key to uh, British prosperity, he was a classic, he was sort of the classic Whig historian in some ways, uh, he talks about the union of order and liberty. Uh, that uh, freedom to do new things, but an ordered society in which, you know, the, so that it's sort of a Goldilocks thing, not, not too hot with so much liberty and civic disassociation that the thing flies apart, or not so cold that there's no innovation and conformity controls everything. And probably if Britain has an inner vice, it's toward being too cold. If Britain leans on one side of that, it's being too cold, and we probably lean to being too hot. Uh, we, we tend to sort of being incoherently ungovernable and so anti-establishment that we, you know, we, we don't even have a government, um, would be sort of the, Amer I'm reminded of uh, Jacksonian legislatures in the 1830s that passed laws forbidding states or any university from giving out an MD degree because the idea that one American citizen had some like qualifications. Uh, to issue drugs that you know some some other American didn't have was aristocratic and bad, so you know our fault, our our, our kind of overlying fault may be toward that kind of anarchic uh, incapacity, and the British toward a rigidity and a kind of a class bound or let's just say establishment thinking. Um, interesting, I think in the 20th century the English fell victim to that pretty hard. If you look both, with the exception of World War II the years between the fall of Lloyd George and the rise of Maggie Thatcher were basically years of pretty good conformity in the British ruling establishment so that left and right bickered but didn't really disagree. <laughs> pretty much everybody backed Neville Chamberlain. You know, so the British and pretty much everybody backed the disastrous post-war economic policies that ended up making Britain the sick man of Europe. So in one sense the British establishment was never so harmonious and so united and so full of good feeling as when it was steering the country into the ditch. Uh, and again, as I say, we have probably the opposite problem here of uh, uh, just, you know, our, our, our suspicion of authority, our suspicion of establishments and so on is so great that it's sometimes hard for us to govern ourselves at all. Walter, thank you. I think I'll uh, call time just to deliver on our promise to get people going and uh, thank, thank our audience uh, for making time for us this afternoon and also for the excellent quality of your comments and questions, really uh, outstanding. And thank you, Walter, for making time for New America on your uh, book tour. I know that you have uh, fiduciary responsibilities as a visiting board member, and I'd just like to point out cup that our excellent first commenter is drinking from there as he has his coke. It's a reused Halloween boo cup. So uh, we, we continue to run lean here. Uh, and thank Does you. Does this mean you made him bring it back or <laughs> <laughs> someone else's cup? Yeah.
staff involved in cups since Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as a board member, you think, and, and what's the staff doing drinking a bunch of fancy Halloween? <laughs> yeah, that's right, okay. Well, but y'all have a Halloween party or something? I'll make, I'll make an item on the January board agenda. Thank you, Walter. Thank you.